All right. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Duncan with BI 101 Explorations in Biology. Um, this is our second class. It's on ecosystems. And so we're going to explore and understand the, the foundations for ecosystems, these things out there in nature that keep us alive and uh, provide a lot of things to, to make our lives uh, a lot better and more interesting. Um, before we get started, let me remind you that it is good study strategy to take notes. So create your own outline and write out your own notes as we go through this lecture. Uh, you can hit the pause button as often as you want to shut me up to do that. Um, I encourage you to write things out in your own words because that helps you process, mentally process the information and express it in your own way, which will be easier for you to remember during an exam or a quiz. And um, I would encourage you to integrate your notes from the class lecture, this, this presentation, into your study guide for this whole, associated with this whole class. So that also includes your textbook reading in this case and any other um, videos or readings that I've assigned for a particular class. And then that study guide becomes your go-to um, your go-to place for studying for the course. You don't have to like pull all the information from all these different sources all over the place, which will drive you crazy when it comes to exam time. You'll have everything you need in one place written in ways that you understand it. And, um, and that's really the best way to study. That's all active learning processing. And uh, if you just sit here and passively listen to what I'm saying, you'll retain some of it, but not much. So take that active approach. That's the best way to learn. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, in, in ecology, and we talked a little bit about this in the previous class, <clears throat> when we were talking about scales of biodiversity, in ecology, there's uh, scales as well. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, ecology at the ecosystem level, understanding the interactions between organisms and the non-living world. Um, there, but there's also ecology at the global scale, and we're going to spend a little bit of time coming up soon looking at that. And there's also, you can look at ecology at the community scale, which is ignoring all the things like water, air, soil, and stuff like that, but and just looking at the interactions among species. We're going to spend time there as well. And we'll also spend time later on at the population scale, looking at um, the kinds of things that influence whether populations are growing or shrinking or how fast they're growing or shrinking or whether they're stable. Okay, But today we're going to be just focusing on ecosystems and, and how, they, uh, how they operate. Um, and as it says here on this slide, inter-ecosystems, we would define that as uh, the, for any particular location, it's the interactions um, it's all the components of the environment. It's the water, the sunlight, the air, the air temperature, the soil, the soil nutrients, the structure of the landscape, all that non-living stuff, also known as abiotic stuff. And it's the integration of that with the living stuff, the biotic stuff. That's all the living organisms and so forth. So that's what an ecosystem is. Okay. Now, um, when we look at ecosystems and how they function, um, there's two main types of functions that we want to pay attention to as we get started. Uh, one is the flow of energy, and the other is the flow of nutrients through um, through the through the ecosystem. Now, by energy, we're not talking about some sort of like mystic karma, crystal energy, or anything like that. We're talking about the energy to do work. So think of that as like how much work you can do if you eat your favorite candy bar, um, right? Like all that energy that's packed in there, how much activity can you turn that into? Everything from basic running basic metabolism in your body to maybe doing a workout to make up for the fact that you just ate a candy bar. Um, what are nutrients? Nutrients are the, the types of atoms and molecules that we need in order to um, build our bodies and keep ourselves healthy and so forth. You can think of them kind of like as vitamins in some ways, but um, think of it as like calcium, right? You're, you, you might have had somebody in your life when you're young saying, hey, drink your milk, you need your calcium for your bones, right? Well, calcium is a nutrient, and yes, you need your calcium for your bones, and yes, you keep needing your calcium for your bones even when you're an adult because those, those uh, atoms get replaced. Anyway, 
Okay, so we're going to start off here focusing on energy and then we'll move on to nutrients a little bit later. All right, to get us started thinking about uh, how these eco how ecosystems work, um, I've just got a couple boxes here representing some species that we might see on the forest uh, uh, um, on the forest oh, that's on the uh, west side of campus um, at the Ecoscape. We got a mosquito, a mockingbird, a red-tailed hawk, a squirrel, an uh, oak tree with some acorns, and some uh, mushrooms down at the bottom. All right. So if we look at how these organisms interact um, in terms of their feeding relationships, we see that they are connected. Um, for example, we see that um, the we'll start with the with the top predator here, the red-tailed hawk. The red-tailed hawk uh, loves to eat squirrels, and so we got an arrow here going from the squirrel to the hawk, showing that energy that is stored in the body of the squirrel winds up being consumed and used by the hawk. Um, every once in a while, the hawk might capture one of these uh, mockingbirds and these smaller birds and uh, and and eat it eat that okay the hawk does not eat acorns it does not have the ability to do that so you do not see an arrow from the oak tree that connects directly to the hawk um, the squirrel however eats acorns so it's there's an arrow linking the the tree to the squirrel and so forth okay I threw in here a mosquito mosquito is a parasite it takes a blood meal off of anything that it can um, it can land on and and pierce with its proboscis and take some blood um, that would include you and me if we were in this picture. Um, and uh, you see an arrow from the mockingbird to the mosquito, and you also see an arrow from the squirrel to the mosquito as well. Okay, I think you get the picture now. Um, one of the things that I haven't explained is this bottom square down here. Okay, Mushrooms are decomposers. Uh, most of a mushroom is down in the soil. You can't see it. It's this network of these little strands that we call hyphae. And those hyphae are basically um, digesting the dead organic matter that's in the soil. Um, so as all these organisms die, whether it's the leaves or limbs from the oak tree, or it's the carcasses of these animals or what have you, um, the decomposers like bacteria and fungi are going to um, strip the last of the remaining energy from those molecules and turn it into energy that they can use. So ultimately, all the energy flowing in this ecosystem winds up down here in this bottom corner. Okay, and then um, <clears throat> and that and so that's the the flow of energy through these ecosystem through an ecosystem. And one of the things that I wanted to also talk about here is that nutrients are following the same pathways. Um, but nutrients are doing something different. You see that I, I clicked and this new arrow appeared here linking the, the fungi over here to the tree. That's because nutrients, after the fungi are done with them um, and the bacteria and all that are done with them, they're in the soil and they're taken up by the plant roots. So nutrients then wind up cycling around and around and around through the ecosystem continuously. But energy never does that. Energy, it's always a one-way flow. Um, there's no recycling of energy. Otherwise, life on our planet would be very different. We'll talk a little bit more about that very soon here. Okay, moving on now. Um, we're going to talk about trophic levels. Trophic is just a fancy word of saying feeding. Um, and in biology, we use that word a lot for whatever reason. And um, and we're going to talk about feeding levels in ecosystems between species. Here we got a, a snowshoe hare and a lynx. Um, in the last moment of life for that poor little um, snowshoe hare. Although you never know, maybe it made, maybe it escaped. Okay, we're gonna. I got a lot of terms here for you to learn. Um, Biology is full of that, so you're gonna have a lot of vocabulary um, to to learn as we go through this course. Um, in ecosystems, there are some organisms that feed themselves. Uh, plants, for example, um, they capture uh, energy from the environment and they're producing their, their own organic compounds as a result. Um, and because they are uh, doing that, we call them autotrophs. So troph means feeding and auto means self. So we're talking about self feeders here. Okay. Um, the uh, Another term that you'll often see, maybe in your textbook or some of the videos that we watch, that these organisms are primary producers because they are the ones that are the first in line 
to pull energy from the environment into the ecosystem. Uh, so primary producers, autotrophs are the same thing. Examples of what autotrophs are include, of course, plants, um, but they also include some bacteria that are able to do photosynthesis and capture sunlight and turn it into energy, or the few bacteria that are able to get chemical energy from their environment. Those are called uh, um, chemotrophs. Um, and we also have um, uh, phytoplankton out on the ocean like microscopic drifting algae that are out there that do a lot of the heavy lifting on our planet in terms of capturing sunlight and turning it into organic energy okay so that's what autotrophs are uh, moving on now then what's everything else are heterotrophs uh, you and I are heterotrophs we can't go and lay out in the Sun to get our energy that would be nice wouldn't it because we'd spend most of our day just sort of like laying out in the Sun and enjoying um, each other's company and we wouldn't have to work for our food but instead we have to feed on other things um, and that that of course sets up the dynamic for who and what we are <laughs> um, heterotrophs are um, hetero means other troph of course means feed so it's we are uh, other feeders we feed on other organisms all those other organisms that are those other than the tree that we saw in the previous uh, slide, those are all uh, heterotrophs that I see. You see all the boxes down here. Okay, heterotrophs include predators, but they also include uh, animals that eat plants, like the squirrel, and they also include the mushrooms and the bacteria, all those. Uh, decomposers and also detritivores. Detritivores are decomposers that eat large chunks of dead material. So for example, um, earthworms that consume um, decaying leaves, those are detritivores, for example. Okay. Anyway, all of that, um, those are all heterotrophs. If you're not making your own energy um, from the sun or maybe from chemicals in your environment, then you are a hetero heterotroph. Okay. Um, some more terms here so that we can talk more carefully about uh, organisms in an ecosystem. Uh, what you see up at the top is a, is a cartoon illustrating a very simple aquatic food chain. We've got algae here. The algae are eaten by the snail. Uh, the snail is eaten by a fish. The fish is eaten by a bird. Okay, So there are different steps in this food chain and we have different terms for those steps. So the very first step here, these are your primary producers. We saw that term in the other slide. It's not on this slide. Those are your plants, your primary producers or autotrophs. Okay. Um, the primary consumers are the ones that are eating the primary producers. So our snail is a primary consumer. So consumer in this context means an organism that is eating another organism. Okay. So, um, so the snail is the first in line to eat the, 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 the plants, and so we call it a primary consumer. The fish is second in line in the food chain by eating the snail, so it's two steps away from the plants. We call it a secondary consumer. And the egret, the bird over here, would be a tertiary consumer. Okay. Now, every once in a while, actually not every once in a while, all the time, organisms will kind of jump around, especially predators. So sometimes uh, the egret will eat fish, that's its favorite meal, but if it's really hungry it might eat a snail. And when the egret eats a snail, at that very moment it becomes a secondary consumer. Um, when it's eating fish, it's a tertiary consumer. So some organisms are versatile in their, their movement um, up and down the food chain. <clears throat> Okay, I think I've already said this before down here, the difference between decomposers and detritivores. I'll leave that for you to read on your own. Now, energy flow in ecosystems. Um, one of the very key messages that I want you to learn here um, is that energy is a one-way flow through ecosystem. It starts from the sun, and the energy comes from the sun to the earth. That energy that's in sunlight is captured by plants, and then that energy stored in plants is eaten by animals. Um, and as energy travels through the food chain, it dissipates. A lot of energy is simply lost to the environment. So for example, as you're sitting there listening to me blather on about ecosystems, um, you are burning calories and 
turning that into usable energy that your cells are using to keep your brain active, to keep your muscles moving, to keep your, uh, to keep breathing, to keep repairing, you know, body tissues and stuff. You're using a lot of that energy, but some of that energy is just lost to the environment and doesn't do you any good. That's the heat energy, right? Um, so you're sitting there radiating heat. That heat is energy, and it came from your food, which came from either animal or plant material that you ate, which ultimately came from the sun. But as that heat radiates away from you into your surrounding environment, it's unorganized. Um, there's no way to recapture that heat and turn it into something useful. So it's lost to the universe forever. <laughs> um, and, um, and as a consequence, um, all energy eventually um, gets dissipated into the universe, into the surrounding environment. Um, and does not get recycled. So that's why we have to keep eating. If we could recycle our energy, we could have just like one meal and be done, right? That would be nice, although I really do enjoy eating. Um, but uh, otherwise, it would be nice to not have to just feed all the time when you're hungry, right? Okay, so energy is that way, and because it's that way um, of, of being a one-way flow through our ecosystems and because of it dissipating ultimately into the surrounding environment, it sets up um, you know, food chains and, this, and the way that ecosystems work on our planet as we'll continue to look at here. Okay, let's talk a little bit now about the capture of the energy from the sun by plants. Okay, that's what autotrophs are doing. Um, they are converting um, basically solar radiation radiation from a ginormous fusion reaction, uh, what is it, 95 million miles away, I think that's the distance to the sun, and it's capturing that radiation and turning it into chemical energy that the plant then uses to, to do its own business, uh, to, to grow, to reproduce, to defend itself, and so forth. In the process, the, those initial steps of capturing that sunlight, plants are creating sugar. Okay, and then they use that sugar, they burn that sugar, just like you and I burn sugar when we consume it. Uh, they burn that sugar and to fuse other atoms together to make different compounds that they need um, in their tissues. Like things, and by other atoms, I mean things like carbon and um, <clears throat> um, nitrogen and phosphate and potassium and calcium and all that kind of stuff. Okay, but that very first step of capturing sunlight and turning it into chemical energy is called photosynthesis. And I only ask you to learn two chemical formulas in this class, and one of them is photosynthesis, the very, uh, very easy version of learning the photosynthetic um, chemical reaction, and that's down here in blue. Okay, so we have an equation here. It's this plus this plus this yields, that's what this symbol here, yields this plus this. Okay, so let's walk our way through that. So what plants are doing with photosynthesis is they're combining sunlight plus carbon dioxide obtained from the atmosphere plus water that they take up through their roots and then through the process of photosynthesis they wind up um, producing sugar. Um, of course sugar has a more technical term, that's glucose, so I got that written out here. Um, but plants wind up creating glucose and as a byproduct, as sort of a waste product um, from this process, uh, plants wind up uh, creating oxygen gas. And that oxygen gas leaves the leaves and goes into the atmosphere. And guess what? <sighs> That's what we use with every breath, oxygen from plants. Okay, <clears throat> moving on here. All right, uh, this is just... Uh, um, an illustration showing how energy moves through ecosystems to reinforce everything that I've already told you so far. Energy is a one-way flow through ecosystems. It starts with the sun, goes to our primary producers. It winds up being taken up um, a couple paths through ecosystems. If a herbivore, like that snail I showed you, is eating it, that would be in this step. Um, this would be like the fish in, the, in that food chain I showed you, and this would be the heron or the, that bird in that Nope, I'm sorry, I misread. Those are the decomposers. So this is the heron and the fish would be in this box here. When everything dies, they get um, eaten by the decomposers. Their organic tissues get uh, broken down by decomposers and so forth. So that's what we wind up down here. 
and then ultimately it goes down the drain, lost into the to the surrounding environment as unusable energy in the form of heat. Okay. Now there's a couple other pathways here. Um, primary producers' plants are not all eaten by um, animals, so we have some plant material like leaves that just fall to the forest floor and at that point they're dead and they wind up being consumed by decomposers. So we skip going through animals, okay? And then also trees and, and other primary producers, they are losing heat to the environment as they do their own metabolism. And so some of that is, that's this pathway over here. But ultimately all energy winds up being sort of lost to the environment as unorganized energy, also known as heat. Okay, so those are the two things you really need to learn about energy flow. It all comes from this, maybe more than two things. It all comes from the sun. It's a one-way flow, and ultimately all energy is lost to the universe um, as unorganized heat. <clears throat> okay, um, now um, all that's well and good, but I'm more interested in, as my own brand of ecology, I'm very interested in ecosystems and how ecosystems function and why ecosystems are different from one another. And to understand that, um, we can begin to look at primary productivity, which is the rate that organisms are, that in not just any organisms, but it's the rate that autotrophs are capturing energy from the sun and turning it into usable chemical energy for themselves and uh, indirectly for the animals that eat them. Um, the amount of primary productivity, which is that, again, it's the rate of capturing sunlight and turning it into organic um, uh, matter in the ecosystem, that rate is dependent on a couple of factors that I have highlighted in red here. There's the heat, and of the in the in your environment, there's the water, there's the sunlight, and the nutrients in the soil. And I, you'll often see me abbreviating these four as HWSS: heat, water, sunlight, soil. Okay, these things, these four things, and another one that we'll add later, um, govern how much a, an ecosystem is able to do in terms of photosynthesis. And of course, that rate at which it's able to do photosynthesis is primary productivity. Once again, I'll mention that. Okay. Now, every species in an ecosystem has its own optimal growing conditions. So you can think of it like it's got its own Goldilocks zone. It doesn't want too much heat, but needs to have enough. Um, it doesn't need it needs to have just enough water, not too much, not too little, just enough sunlight, not too much, too little, so forth and so on. Okay, um, so that's this last point down here. All right, so what do we got here? Uh, I've introduced the term primary productivity, the rate of an ecosystem or organisms capturing sunlight and turning it into usable chemical energy. It's dependent on these factors highlighted in red here. And of course, each species has its optimal zone. Now, turning that into understanding ecosystems, um, here at the bottom you see two different ecosystems. Um, I picked uh, a desert in, um, in Arizona, and I also picked a forest here in Alabama. That's from the Bankhead National Forest. And um, these are at the same latitude, meaning the same distance from the equator, same distance from the poles, so they get the same amount of sun energy um, all year long. But obviously, these are very different ecosystems. One's extremely hot and dry, and the other is hot. I wouldn't say extremely hot, but it is hot here in Alabama, and it's really humid, very wet. Okay, And all this to illustrate primary productivity. In the desert ecosystem, you see some plants there, but it's not a lot compared to the forest that you see in the picture to the right. The forest at the right has a much higher level of primary productivity. And the reason is because of water. You probably guessed that already because you know that deserts are dry, right? So climate is affecting the availability of heat and water and sunlight. And geology is what's influencing the availability of soil nutrients. And whenever you change any one of these four factors by going to different places in in an environment like out your back door or traveling far distances and stuff, anytime you change those four factors, you're going to change the ecology of that location. 
And that's why you have deserts um, and forests at the same latitude, um, which gets the same amount of, of sunlight. Um, is, is, and the big difference there is the amount of water. It rains a lot more in Alabama than it does in Arizona. Okay, so those are the factors and the ways that primary productivity um, is, is varies across the planet and yields ecosystem diversity. Okay, let's turn now back to food chains. Um, we saw one already with the um, that I used earlier. Here's another one that shows uh, like an Alaskan um, northern high in the northern um, hemisphere food chain where you've got at the top you've got a top carnivore, a grizzly bear who likes to eat a lot of salmon who and the salmon eat smaller fishes and those smaller fishes eat tinier fishes and those tinier fishes eat itty bitty fishes down here that are eating algae. Okay, that's basically your food chain. And food chains are very simplistic representations of how energy moves through ecosystems um, from one organism to the next. They don't really represent the feeding strategies that actually exist, though. These are this is good for like you know middle school like ecology. Let's take a look at um, what we should be learning in high school and college. That's food webs. <clears throat> food webs show the the complex network of feeding relationships between organisms, and you see that in this illustration over here to the right. Um, my I tried to find one that was also a um, like an Arctic or Alaskan uh, food chain, and this is the best one I could find. It doesn't have the sun in there, so it kind of um, pisses me off a little bit. I wish we had a sun down here that was like with an arrow from the sun down to these these uh, these plants. Um, but we don't have that, so now you can just imagine it. All right, all this to show that um, the feeding relationships between organisms. <clears throat> are much more variable than what you can depict in a food chain. So, for example, um, I'm going to go to the red-tailed hawk again, which is also found in Alaska. Uh, the red-tailed hawk might eat a grouse, it might eat a chipmunk, it might eat a marmot. Okay, those are, um, you know, those are those have their own positions in in the food web with different arrows connecting them. The grouse, for example, might eat seeds from the plant, or it might actually. Um, eat you know some berries and flowers from from these tundra plants, or it might eat an insect like um, a butterfly. Okay, so the food webs show the reality of feeding relationships in <clears throat> in ecosystems. Okay, um, the second note over here: organisms position change through time because as organisms grow, their feeding needs change. So, for example. Um, when frogs are tadpoles, they eat a lot of algae, but as adults, those frogs are eating insects. So just, just to illustrate that things change. <clears throat> All right, moving on here. Um, I just wanted to harken back to the first class where I used this illustration to show a, um, a marine food web. So just to sort of connect the dots for you here about this is, this is more like how scientists are going to depict a food web um, when they're doing intense levels of research on food webs and looking at how much energy is moving between different species. Not just whether that energy is moving, but how much is moving and so forth. Um, I just wanted to connect the dots that I showed you this illustration earlier. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about how food webs and food chains are connected to some of these properties about the movement of energy through ecosystems. Recall that I told you that energy is a one-way flow, and we're going to see that here, and how a lot of energy is lost to the environment. We're also going to see that here. What you're looking at here is the results from a study that was done a couple of decades ago looking at a lake ecosystem up in Ohio, and it looked at um, the amount of organisms at each step in the food chain. And that's what these blue bars represent. This is essentially a bar graph sort of turned on its side so it looks three-dimensional here. Okay, And what these researchers have done for us is to say, is to start off with a, um, a, a chunk of for lack of a better word, a chunk of algae and cyanobacteria. These are your primary producers. These are the little tiny floating plants in the lake that are capturing sunlight and turning it into usable chemical energy for themselves and indirectly and inadvertently um, wind up being, becoming food for, um, for consumers. And we're going to track through this diagram a thousand calories worth of these 
um, primary producers. Okay, so down at the bottom here, what we're doing is we're seeing how much energy is stored in the ecosystem um, based on these 1,000 calories. Okay, I said stored, but what I really mean is how much energy is used from those 1,000 calories. You'll, you'll see as I get started here. Okay. So the first step in the food chain is that you've got small heterotrophs that are in the lake, like little microscopic things that you'd have to see under a microscope that are swimming around and eating the algae. Okay, <clears throat> Those little guys, um, if you were to look at how, many, how much of them could be supported by 1,000 calories of algae and cyanobacteria, it's only 150 calories. Okay, so they these guys are eating a thousand calories worth of algae and cyanobacteria, but a lot of the energy that they consume is just burned off and lost to the environment. It's it's sort of wasted, like we talked about earlier. And it's only 150 calories that are in the bodies of those small heterotrophs. So let me just say that again one more time. Of the 1,000 calories of primary producers, they only support 150 calories of these primary consumers, these small heterotrophs. Okay, And that's because, like I said earlier, a lot of energy is lost to the environment um, whenever organisms are, are burning it off and then whenever organisms are feeding on one another. Um, that's just the nature of, of the business. Um, when these small heterotrophs are eaten by very small fishes called smelt, which are young trout, okay, um, that 150 calories of those small heterotrophs can only support 30 calories worth of, a, of smelt. That might be just like one, one minnow, maybe two or three minnows, maybe a minnow and a half, because we're not talking about numbers of organisms, we're talking about the how much mass or weight of those organisms here, okay? And then 30 calories of smelt can only support, um, say, because smelt are small fish, they're eaten by trout, um, 30 calories of smelt can only support about 6 calories in a trout. So in other words, a trout, which has got a lot more calories in it than 6, a trout would probably have, I'm guessing here, like many hundreds, maybe a several thousand calories in a full adult trout. Okay, so one smelt can only support like a little bit of the, of the energy that's in the trout. So trout have to eat a lot of smelt. Smelt have to eat a lot of small heterotrophs. Small heterotrophs have to eat a lot of algae and cyanobacteria. Okay, they also threw humans here on here to say, okay, what if humans were eating smelt, etc. Okay, um, and that leads to the question, what would be an ecologically efficient diet for us? Well, if you like to eat fish, um, if you don't, I, I, I get that, that's cool. Um, but if you like to eat fish, you would probably prefer to eat a trout because it's a nice big filet that you get off that trout. Rather than eating a bunch of minnows, you can eat minnows. Nothing's going to kill you from eating minnows. I've eaten minnows before um, out of necessity and then also out of just curiosity. Um, you can eat minnows. It's just fine. Um, but if you were trying to live off this lake, um, you'd have to work hard to catch trout. And you'd have to um, – because there's fewer trout in the environment than there are of small minnows. A more ecologically efficient diet for us would be to eat the small minnows because – if you look at the transfer of energy from the small minnows to the trout, you're losing so much. You've gone from 30 calories down to six. Okay, but an even more efficient diet would be for us to to eat the algae. But we don't have the digestive system that can digest algae and cyanobacteria. We would basically starve to death in that case. Okay, so the take-home message here is to illustrate how energy moves through the food chain and how energy is lost at each step of the food chain. Um, and in fact, as we'll see, I think in the next slide, there's a rule of thumb that about only 10% of the energy transfers from one step in the food chain to the next. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. Okay, so energy transfer. <clears throat> like I just said, it's only about 10% of energy is transferred from one organism to the next um, as uh, organisms feed on one another. Okay, so why is that? Well, um, energy is lost for a lot of different reasons, and that's illustrated in this little cartoon at the top right. This beetle eating a leaf, um, some of the material in the plant 
um, cannot be digested by the beetle. It's just um, it's fibers and things that it can't digest, and so that comes out as feces. Feces or, or poop. Um, feces has energy in them, um, and but that's energy that's going to be used by decomposers because the beetle's not able to to use that. So that's 50% of what the beetle eats. Another 33% goes into just keeping the beetle alive, just burning that energy to 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 move, to keep your organs functioning, all that kind of stuff. Okay, <clears throat> and then only 17% of that energy from from eating the plant goes into growth, basically as the beetle grows in size. So that's a, that's a little bit more than our rule of thumb of 10%, but it's approximately um, at that 10% level. Um, what else do I want to say here? Um, some, so some of the other things to think about how and why energy is lost in these feeding relationships, you're not consuming all the body parts. I kind of put a picture of a lion eating a zebra down here. The lion is not going to eat the bone, but there's lots of bone. I mean, there's lots of energy in the bone. Uh, the lion's not going to eat the fur, or, or at least intentionally. There's probably some organs that the lion's not going to eat because it's like, I mean, why would you eat like the long intestine of a zebra when you can eat all that nice muscle, right? Thinking at it from a lion's perspective, okay? Um, so this is these are all the different ways that energy is lost, okay? Now. So we've talked about the flow of energy through ecosystems. We've talked about that rule of thumb that only about 10% of energy is transferred from one food, from one step in the food chain to the next. This has consequences, big consequences for us and life on Earth. In terms of ecosystems, um, th this limits how many links you can have in a food chain. Um, so, for example, if there was a predator on the African savanna that was eating lions, it would have, there wouldn't be a lot of them because there are not many lions out there. Okay, you eat a few lions over the span of a month and you're gonna, you're gonna exterminate the local population. Okay, um, so that's why a few lions feed on a lot of zebras. You need a big herd of zebras to support a lot of lions. And you need lots and lots and lots and lots of grasses to support just, you know, a few zebras. Okay, so food chains tend to be limited in their in the numbers of steps, and st and um, most of them stay like six steps or less usually. Okay, ecological pyramids. Um, we're not going to talk about ecological pyramids this semester, so you can just ignore that. Okay, so um, this is just to this is more reinforcement of what we've already talked about, but looking at it in a slightly more detailed level. Uh, cellular respiration is that process where we turn energy into things that our body needs to do, things our cells need to do. Um, I'm assuming you know what a cell is. If you don't, you know, Google it and watch a short, short YouTube video or something on like introduction to biology. What is a cell? Um, <clears throat> so cells are these units in our in our tissues that are doing all the work, and they are burning that energy, and that energy is lost again. After, after they burn it off, it's lost as heat. Um, now, what I want to illustrate here is is the second of the two uh, chemical reactions that I've asked you to learn this semester, and that's the the very simplistic form of cellular respiration that you see in blue here. And <clears throat> this is basically turning uh, stored energy in the form of glucose into the heat that's used by um, by cells to do their work. And this is essentially the reverse of photosynthesis with, with a little bit of a difference here. Okay, So here's what you and I are doing right now. Okay, um, you are, You're taking stored energy in your body um, in terms of glucose or other forms of stored energy and you're breaking it down to um, release heat and, and, and carbon dioxide as a waste product and water. Okay, <clears throat> so this is again that chemical equation where glucose, glucose plus oxygen um, yields heat, carbon dioxide, and water. Um, on the left-hand side of this equation, um, we can't burn energy without oxygen. This is one reason why you die when you don't have enough oxygen. 
um, is that you got to have that oxygen in order to convert the stored energy of glucose or any other forms of stored energy like lipids, which are fats or carbohydrates and stuff. To turn that into energy, you got to combine it with oxygen via a much more elaborate chemical reaction that we don't want to even bother um, looking at here because it's way too complex for, for me um, and, and for our class. That's what the biology students have to learn that. Um, but on a simple form, it's glucose, glucose plus oxygen yielding heat plus carbon dioxide car and water. That carbon dioxide is a waste product. Your body does not use it. That's what you exhale when you breathe. Um, and you're getting rid of that carbon dioxide out of your body. If it accumulates in your body, it can become um, toxic. So we've got to get rid of that. Uh, the heat is the is the energy that's used to um, to do chemical reactions within the cell and then a lot of that heat after it's done doing that it's lost to the environment like we talked about and then of course the second um, product from this is the water that's generated when you break down those glucose molecules and our body just sort of absorbs and uses that water just as it would as if you were drinking water this is called metabolic water and this is why you can Sometimes not drink as much water as you should, but still have enough water because you're getting water as you break down your energy and turn it into um, to heat. <clears throat> okay, moving on here. So that's cellular respiration. That's your second chemical reaction you need to learn. Uh, looks like I lied. Sorry about that. I'm gonna. Um, well, I didn't lie. I just got confused. I mentioned pyramid of numbers earlier and I said you don't have to worry about that because I thought that the next slide was going to be pyramid of numbers but surprise here it is okay and we are going to look at this real quickly it's a simple concept so it's not that big a deal this is basically a way of illustrating in an ecosystem um, the numbers of organisms and how they support um, each other at different levels of the food chain so this is looking at a at that lake ecosystem again and you might have plankton, the small floating plants out there in the environment. There might be four, what is that, four billion plankton. It takes four billion plankton to support 11 herbivores. Those would be those small heterotrophs that are eating the plankton, little guys that you'd need to see under a microscope. And all of those guys can support one minnow. <laughs> it takes 11 herbivores to support one minnow. Okay, so this is illustrating that in ecosystems we tend to have a lot of organisms that are primary producers and many fewer that are herbivores and very few that are carnivores. And every time you add another level to the pyramid, the, the size of that pyramid gets smaller. So if we had a carnivore that was eating this carnivore, it would be a little tiny like block on top of this. And it wouldn't even support all of that carnivore because um, there's not enough of the of the of this this level of carnivore to support um, a, a, a tertiary consumer. Okay, so um, this is what limits food the numbers of steps in a food chain. Okay, to sort of do a recap here um, on energy flow and ecosystems. Um, the energy budget of an ecosystem depends on primary productivity. That's the rate at which an ecosystem is converting solar energy into usable chemical energy. Um, that's what the plants are doing. And the amount of photosynthesis um, that the plants are doing or the amount of primary productivity they do depends on those four factors we talked about. Heat, water, sunlight, and soil. Okay. And of course, energy flows one way through ecosystems. I don't have that on this slide, but you've seen it 3,000 times by now. Um, it, energy flows one way, and it's also a lot of it is lost as it goes through the ecosystem um, because we just burn it off as heat, which is unorganized energy that's lost forever. Okay, so that's energy flow. <clears throat> We're now going to take a look at uh, nutrients. We're getting near the end there's, because I don't spend quite as much time on nutrient cycling um, because a lot of the same principles apply. All right, so nutrients. Um, let's take a look at this. So what are nutrients? Um, these are these are atoms and in, in some cases molecules that are essential for life. Um, water, for example, is a molecule and it's essential for life. It's technically a nutrient. But here's some other important nutrients over here. We got nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, potassium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, all this sort of stuff. 
Um, we don't exist as just pure energy. We are matter, and this is the stuff that is the matter in our bodies, right? And a lot of it's carbon, of course, because we are carbon-based life forms. Um, all right, so, so that's what nutrients are. And unlike energy, nutrients can cycle through ecosystems. Um, and so they can continually be, be used from one organism to the next without ever wearing out, so to speak. Okay? They change form in these sort of, like chemically change form and, and things like that. But, um, but technically, over the longer scheme of things, they just keep recycling. Okay? Now nutrients, this is this point down here, nutrients tend to be, m many nutrients tend to be in limited supply in um, ecosystems. Um, one that's not in limited supply is oxygen. There's enough oxygen for organisms to, to, to breathe and for plants to do what they do and all that. Um, but if you were living in a desert, water would be a limited nutrient, right? Um, if you're living um, in, in most terrestrial ecosystems, nitrogen is one that, and phosphorus is another that are really limiting, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so these things can limit how much life exists in an ecosystem because if there's not enough nutrients, you're not going to have um, as many organisms. Okay. Now, uh, biology textbooks are full of diagrams like this when we talk about ecosystems. These are uh, illustrations that show the flow of nutrients through ecosystems. I'm not going to ask you to learn all the different... Um, uh, nutrient cycles that are in your textbook um, that they get without context they get kind of boring <laughs> so uh, I want you to learn one and I'll put it in context in just a minute and I want you the one I want you to learn is the phosphorus cycle um, phosphorus is is really important for living organisms um, it's we use phosphorus for example as a component in our in our bones we also use phosphorus as, um, more importantly and directly, as a one of the atoms that is in the DNA molecule. And we also use phosphorus to store energy. Some of you might be familiar with uh, a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And we basically, ATP is triphosphate, right? So that's three phosphate um, uh, molecules. And um, each one of those has a phosphorus atom at its, its center. So that's how we store energy. We store them in these molecules called ATPs. And when we burn off that energy, we convert it to ADP, diphosphate, which just has two phosphorus. And then when we need to store energy again, we add a phosphate uh, back to that. Anyway, that's, we don't need to know that for this course. So that was just FYI only. All that to illustrate that phosphorus is a really important atom for um for, for life, all life on planet, okay? And this illustration shows how phosphorus moves through ecosystems. And one of the things that I want you to notice is that sometimes the phosphorus is moving through the living part of the ecosystem. So for example, um, plants, uh, the phos phosphorus that's in the plants go to the herbivores like the snails, the snail dies, its body part is broken down by the decomposers. Um, but sometimes the phosphorus is in the soil. So as the decomposers die, um, the, 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 the nutrients in their bodies wind up being into the soil, and that's this box representing here. And then plants can take that up through their roots. That's one of the things that plant roots do. They're, they're searching the ground. They're moving. Roots don't move, but they just keep growing in different directions, looking for nutrients like, like phosphate, phosphate being... Um, a phosphorus molecule with some oxygen stuck on it. That's that's how we use phosphorus. We have to use it in the phosphate form in living organisms. Okay, so um, so some of that phosphate is in the non-living part of the ecosystem. So all this to show and to say that phosphorus is moving through the living part of the ecosystem as well as through the um, the non-living part of the ecosystem. And you can follow the arrows through here and see that in many different ways, including this, the, when phosphor, phosphorus becomes part of sediments in the lake bed or the ocean floor, um, and then over long periods of time that becomes new rock, and then the rock is uplifted through geologic processes, and then it's weathered and comes back into the soil and so forth. Okay, so um, that's uh, uh, phosphorus. The one thing that you don't see here is that there's no phosphorus flying through the air here. For other, um, 
for other nutrients, you, there's oftentimes an atmospheric component to it, but we don't see that here. Although technically dust blowing across the landscape or from Africa to North America is a component of that, but that's not in here. Anyway, moving on. Um, all right, so I've asked you to read an article about from National Geographic called The Fertilized World. Okay, Here's what I suggest. If you haven't read that article yet, go ahead and hit the pause button on this video and then take a few minutes to read that article. Take some notes on it. Those articles are not just there for fluff, right? Um, you can expect a quiz question or an exam question on most of the articles that I assign or videos that I assign. Okay, so take a moment now and and read through that and because it will introduce you to the uh, one of the huge problems that humanity is having with um, with uh, the with the overabundance of nutrients that we've caused in our ecosystems so go ahead and do that for a moment Okay, I assume you've read the article now and you're all up to speed on this huge problem that we have. I want to remind you that in class one, I showed you this kind of like a pie chart, like a bar chart turned into a pie chart that showed nine planetary systems that on which humanity depends. And we talked about how the loss of biodiversity is one of those systems that we have driven into the red zone, um, where we're in, the, in a zone of high risk of endangering our ability to live on the planet. Well, guess what? One of the other three that we have driven into the red zone is this one. Um, the, messing with the biogeochemical processes on the planet, especially the flow of phosphorus and nitrogen um, and a few others like sulfur uh, through, through our ecosystems. Okay. Now, um, what I want to talk about is the, how the phosphorus cycle is related to this. Um, we humans, we wind up tinkering with, tinkering is an understatement, we wind up tinkering with the phosphorus cycle in some big ways. Um, so for example, um, farmers put fertilizers out on their, on their fields and sometimes homeowners will do that with gardens and landscapers do that with gardens and stuff like that. If those phos fertilizers stayed in place, there would be no problem. Plants would use them and then do their thing and we'd eat the plants and stuff or watch the plants if they're just landscaping, whatever. But the problem is, is that rains wash the, the excess fertilizers down into our, in our streams, streams flow into rivers, rivers flow into our lakes and our oceans and so forth. And so our ecosystems wind up getting too much of the phosphate. Okay. Um, another example of how... Um, we tinker with this is through sewage. So when you flush, that goes down down the drain and gets wind up going either downhill or to a pumping station that that sends it down to the local wastewater treatment plant, WWTP. Um, and at the wastewater treatment plant, they kill off the nasty bacteria. They use decomposers to break down a lot of the organic material. But one thing that they but most treatment plants do not do is remove all the nutrients that are in the stuff that goes to the wastewater treatment plant. And the, so the water that they put back into the environment, they pump into a lake or a stream or sometimes out into the ocean, it's laden with nutrients. Um, and so that's another way that we mess with the phosphorus cycle. And this, as you know from reading the Nat Geo article, um, causes big problems for us. Okay, this all harkens back to um, something I talked about a few minutes ago, which is organisms live in their Goldilocks zone, or they want to anyway. Too much of a good thing is a is bad. Too little of a good thing is bad. So in the case of phosphorus, we're we're now talking about too much of a good thing. Okay, so too much phosphorus or nitrogen or some of these other um, nutrients in our environment. Causes, cause a problem called eutrophication. Big old word there, lots of vocabulary for you this, this, this uh, class, I know. Um, eutrophication. Eutrophication means simply too many nutrients in the ecosystem. Um, and here's what happens. As, as, too much, as phosphorus flows into, say, a lake ecosystem, the algae love it. The algae are like, yes, we can grow a lot more now because we've got phosphorus. And before we were limited, 
and we couldn't grow because we didn't have enough phosphorus to 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 make more DNA or to um, to you know to grow in body size and reproduce and so forth. Um, these plants are getting plenty of water. Obviously, they're in the water. They're getting plenty of sunlight, but they don't have enough nutrients to grow to their maximum capacity. And when we add that phosphorus to the environment, they grow like crazy. And you see these mats of algae um, floating on the surface of lakes and so forth. Um, or in the previous picture, I'm going to toggle back for a second. Um, you see this from the Nat Geo article. That's all phytoplankton growing out there, algae growing out there on that lake. Um, um, so that's a problem. Okay. The reason it's there's many reasons why it's a problem. One of them is that these plants have a short lifespan and they die. And when they die, they drift down into the lake water or out into the ocean. If, if you're in the ocean, you're out in the in, to the depths of the ocean. And as they drift down. Um, decomposers, bacteria and fungi, will colonize their bodies and then start breaking them down to strip out the energy and the nutrients so that the bacteria and the fungi can thrive. Okay, um, That's what decomposers do. But de aquatic decomposers, um, they use oxygen. Just like you and I use oxygen to stay alive and to, and to burn energy and so forth, they do too. And their populations go bonkers with all this plant material drifting down from above. And as a consequence, they use up all the oxygen that's in the water. And when they do that, it makes it really hard for other organisms like fish to survive. So here on the, on the right, um, we've got a picture of a fish kill um, that was caused by low levels of oxygen in this water that was caused by um, uh, the eutrophication. Okay, so all this to illustrate that um, when we um, mess with our ecosystems and kind of push them beyond their their limits, um, they they don't disappear, but they they get um, they get to the point where a lot of organisms can't survive like they have in the past, and that's really bad for biodiversity, and it's really bad for us because we would like to maybe eat these fish. We don't like smelling all these stinky fish rotting on our seashores. I mean, who wants to go to the beach when there's a bunch of dead fish everywhere? Or the algae themselves sometimes um, emit toxic gases that can actually send people to the hospital for some species. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why eutrophication is a bad thing. Okay. Um, I want to, we're going to wrap up here soon. Um, I want to tie this back now to biodiversity, specifically Alabama biodiversity, one of the themes of this course. I've got three pictures here, each from a different location in Alabama. All these locations get roughly the same amount of sunlight. They all get a lot of rain. Um, they're all warm for most of the year and cold for just a few short months. Um, but yet they look vastly different. Okay, we've got the beach dunes at the bottom. We've got Little River Canyon here on the left. We've got a glade ecosystem that's almost like a desert ecosystem um, where trees can't grow um, here on the far right. The difference between these ecosystems isn't in terms of the heat or the water or the sunlight. It's the nutrient availability. Okay, it's the nutrients that are in the soil. So you, you might have noticed I'm using that HWSS um, formula that we talked about earlier, right? Okay, in these cases, we're dealing with situations where the availability of nutrients is driving the shape and the function of these ecosystems. Let's start here on the left. Little River Canyon, lush forest ecosystem. There's lots of nutrients that are there. Um, so plants are able to grow very easily. That's why it's filled with trees, okay? The dune ecosystem down here. The soils in the dune ecosystem are just sands with a few other trace elements. And sands um, are is basically just silicon dioxide. It's basically the same stuff that's in glass. There's not much nutrients in, in beach sands. And as a consequence, very few plants can grow. Um, sands are also really bad for storing uh, water, but it rains a lot down there so that they still would wind up getting a lot of water. It's really the other nutrients like phosphorus. Uh, phosphate and, and nitrate and that sort of thing that's limiting plant growth here and making it look like a desert. Over here in this glade ecosystem here we have too much of a, a nutrient. It's, in this case is too much magnesium. These rocks here are a type of rock called dolomite 
and they have high levels of magnesium in it that that's toxic to most plants. Only a few species of plants can grow on this situation. They're really cool plants and there's like eight species that are found in that picture that are only found in these very few rock outcrops of dolomite um, that's just to the southwest here of Birmingham. Um, however, they can't support trees and things like that. You see those in the background where the soils are different. Okay, all of this to illustrate that variation in soil nutrients affects what our ecosystems look like and what species can be there. All right, um, one final thing to talk, I think it's final. Yeah, we're getting there. Um, one final thing to talk about nutrients is that they are not distributed evenly in the environment. Um, and that's true for heat and water and sunlight as well. Um, the, and as a consequence, we wind up seeing that organisms in the environment tend to be clumped or clustered. Um, so for example, you'll find a bunch of plants of a particular species growing in one area, but not other areas. Okay? You only rarely in ecosystems see organisms distributed in a uniform pattern like you see in this green square in the middle. Um, and you might think you might, if I were to ask you, like, before you had this course, you might, if I said, like, which of these patterns is what you'd expect to find with, with organisms, you'd probably say, oh, yeah, they're just sort of randomly out there. They're not. Um, organisms are only very rarely um, random and rarely uniform. Most of the time, a for a particular species, they are clumped in the environment. They are found only in particular areas, okay? And that's important for structuring ecosystems. And we'll see why as we get into some of our other classes and look at ecosystems on a broader level. Okay, so um, energy flow, nutrient flow, what does this image have to do with that? Well, um, <clears throat> the energy that was flowing through Earth's ecosystem back when, um, when large dinosaurs like the brontosaurus was moving around, and Brontosaurus, by the way, I put this on here because Brontosaurus isn't actually a dinosaur. It was like um, we realized that it was there was many species that was when we originally thought they were Brontosaurus. There's many different species that's been split out into different groups. But anyway, back during the dinosaur age, the energy that was flowing from Earth through Earth's ecosystem it is long gone, long gone. Um, the um, with the exception of fossil fuels, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, the, but basically that energy is long gone. But the nutrients, they're still cycling. So it is highly likely that some of the, maybe the calcium in your bones has been in countless other species on planet Earth over time. Um, and um, it's ditto with the other types of nutrients that in your body. And I just think that that's kind of cool. So I kind of wanted to end on that note. So that's it. Um, so this lecture uh, will be, you know, obviously you can come back and, and watch this at your, at, again and again as you need. Make sure you take lots of notes in your own words and integrate this into your own study guides. All right.